A very warm welcome to my community as always. My team and I are pleased that you have joined us. In our last program, Mr. Carl Springer introduced us to his childhood parish, St. Andrew. Hmm. Now, as promised, Mr. Springer is back with us this week. I'm sure that many of us at some point in time have heard stories of the good work of two phenomenal Barbadian ladies whose names are today emblazoned throughout the parish of St. Andrew. One was the first to be elected to Parliament. She did that in 1951, immediately after universal adult suffrage. The second lady is credited for pioneering private transportation in this section of the island. You will learn of how she wisely used the resources around her to help those in need. These stories are being told by a gentleman who walked with them. Take it over, Mr. Springer. As I look back on time, I remember where the shops were in San Andrew. And in King Garden, there was a shop. And the lady looking after that business went by the name of Irma Rock, right in Cane Garden, St. Andrew, not far from the St. Xavier School in those days. The school is not there anymore. Miss Rock carried on the shop for years. Then by St. Andrew suffered as a result of shortage of transport from St. Andrew to town because the then Concessionaire, we call him. Mr. Green and his son got into trouble. And after his son was in prison, Miss Rock saw the void, felt it as well, and she brought the first bus to St. Andrew. She gave it the shopkeeping to run the Rockland Bus Company. Miss Rock lived next to the first shop in St. Andrew. Siebert Worrell, that's the father of Jocelyn's Worrell. Miss Bourne lived at the last shop in Bell Plain, Dary Foster, that's her father. Miss Rock and these people and Dary Foster became very good friends because he was the vestryman. There was a lot of collaboration between the people who had money, like Miss Rock getting some, and Dari Foster, who had. Miss Rock, when dealing with her, Miss Rock started this Rockland transport, as I said earlier, with two buses. And number one was A44 and the other A66. She moved to Bell Plain and built a massive house. The next house after the shop was hers. After some years, she established a, a gas station. Later on, Ms. Rock owned two trucks. Those trucks used to take stones from the bed, the riverbed, to help build the roads in St. Andrew. And young men got a job collecting the rocks and packing them on trucks daily. Those rocks went to build the road, like I said, for the buses to drive on. At the end of that, when the crops started, those two trucks were fitted to take canes to Highgates and Brucevale factories. At the end of the crop, those two trucks were turned into buses. No, she had four buses. And that is how she developed this transport system in St. Andrew. She was a kind woman. I was one of the people, as a boy, that she fell in love with. And 
I used to go to her house at night whenever there was a boxing going on between Joe Louis and Max Mellon, Joe Louis and Jack Sharkey, Joe Louis and Prima Canera, anybody that Louis fought. I was given on a radio, a Phillips radio at her house. And she would come down the road and remind me, boxing is tonight at 10 o'clock. And I would get to lift up the road or walk up the road to her house. The boys in St. Andrew thought that she was my girlfriend, but she was an old lady in my estimation there. But we were good, good friends. When the buses, and I was going to tell them the bus that morning, she would tell the conductor, put your hat in the front seat for Carl. And I would sit up front next to the chauffeur. The other seat next to me was the conductor's own. She had a niece living at her. She later on, she was a teacher at St. Sabres. She was later on called Mrs. Thorpe. She might buy Thorpe, who was working military education, but she would live at Miss Rock. And the Saturday that she was going to town, we all went to town as teachers because we went to East, some classes being set in art and this thing about Miss Town coming to school, something they come to school was on Robux Street. Uh, some college writers now and Erdiston had just been open a few years ago had courses going on at these places. She would sit on the inside and I was on the outside. The conductor was on a running board and Sarah stopped the bus. We said, young man, get out and go behind. Or I would report the bus. The conductor said, report the bus. And he drove, rode a motorcycle to St. Andrew to Miss Rock. She said, I, I didn't report the bus today. But next time I see Carl Springer and Miss Thorpe, Cordelia's got this Miss thing, I mean, sitting in two seats, one belonged to the conductor. I'm going to report it. Miss Rock said, Go ahead, report it. Report the driver. I will pay it. Go. She had this Karma A36, a Chevrolet that she imported from America. And when she was going out, she was stopped by the house. She blow the horn and said, Millie Carl, there, yes, come. We drove all over the northern parishes. Because her husband was in St. Lucy, John Watch, the cricketer, father. But the children had separated. But she would go down there and give him money and things like that, Mr. Rock himself. Because it was, it was said that it was his money that started the business. But she was the businesswoman. And she got assistance from the landowners in St. Andrew who looked at it and said, okay, she has that kind of look like somebody who can save their money. And then there's some black people who hang up with the white people with the money. They hang up with the black people who had nothing. She was one of those kind of people. And Josh Shane's became a very good friend. All in all, it was a successful enterprise she ran in St. Andrew. And we all benefited from the presence of the Rock and Bus Company. As I said earlier, with the other shop was Di Foster's shop. He had about nine children. And one of those girls, he had about four of them, was Ermie Foster. She came, she began a born when she married a born boy from Shorey Village, Ivan Born, her husband. He was a teacher at St. Andrew's Boys School. I went back to teach with them after some time. She was a oh, she was a very forthright woman, very straightforward, very friendly, like to make Joke, but if she had to tell you anything, she would come in straight. She didn't deviate in to leave you wondering what she was trying to tell you. So she had to call you a fool. She did it and said, oh, okay, she hands. That's the kind of person she was. And she would 
walk up and down Belpain Road and speak to people. I didn't understand why she was doing all of this. Until one day, before I left Belpain, she asked me to come and go to St. Simon's with her. And I went. Then we went to Chalky Mount. This is going up the hill. St. Simon's Hill, up Chalky Mount, another hill. And one day talking to Man Luscious and Gill, she said, I am going to get into this thing. I didn't understand what thing she's talking about. Because Luscious and Gill, <clears throat> her father, and a man called Goodman that haven't found his body yet, <clears throat> disappeared one night. We're carrying on a lodge. And I thought there was a lodge she talking about, taking Goodman's place. But it wasn't that. She was watching the political scene. In those days, you didn't have the politicians like now. You had to have money to get into politics. You had to have a certain amount. And if she didn't have her father would have it. And she was in politics from then. A man came from Lakes called Homie Corbin and ran and went into the House of Assembly. All Homie had was an accent that he picked up while in Trinidad. And nobody understands whether he was an American or Trinidadian, but he was that kind of character, a good fella. And he won the seat in St. Andrew. I believe Omi, Ms. Bourne came to conclude, if Omi can do this, I can do it as well. And then she laid down the ground rules. Having told us then as young people, I'm going to run for St. Andrew. And she ran. And she became the first woman to enter the House of Assembly in Barbados. And lastly, the speaker, Mr. Husbands, accompanied by the leader of the House, Mr. Adams, and Mrs. Bourne, the first lady ever to be elected to the House of Assembly. And so, on this memorable day, was written the first page in the history of adult suffrage in Barbados. By that time, she had married Ivan, and she was already born. There's a road in St. Andrew. At first, when I, when I was a boy, it was called Windy Hill. We used to go up there because the, the wind came out of the Atlantic Ocean and came down through Belle Plain. The wind is Windy Hill. Then it was changed to the East Coast Road. And the fellows who do crop over will remember going to the East Coast Road, that was the place to go at Crop Over. And then it was changed to Ernie Bourne Highway. That's what got its name, Ernie Bourne Highway. She, she loved people, and people in St. Andrew loved her too, because she was the first of that kind to come forward and say, I'm gonna run for politics. And I believe every woman in St. Andrew, including my mother, who belonged to the Church of God, voted for Ermi. And in St. Andrew, I'm not boasting, if you want to attract the young people over 21 to vote for you, there are certain people in Belle Plaine, and Belle Plaine was the capital of St. Andrew, that you become very close to. People like Conrad Hunt from Shore Village. Dr. Joe Richards, gynecologist from the Shore Village. A fellow named Clayton Everton Richards from the Shore Village. Leon Bowen, his brother. Once you get that group of youngsters in your corner, you're good. In Lakes, there was a young man by the name of Ashby Jordan who became principal of the Allen School. Cameron Spencer, we call him Cammy Spencer, who was the fastest young man on two feet. And he showed it to the fellas from Harrison College and Lodge and all of them at Kensington Oval one day to Lou Lynch ask where that fella come from. From Lakes, there were other people in Lakes as well. You know, people may not even remember them. But Carl Spray came from Lakes. He came from Lakes. And then there was a guy by the name of Hillary Springer, the captain of the cricket team. St. Simons, you had 
of the Edward Williams boys. You had a fellow named Frank Dottin, who, who used to teach me Greek when I went to the secondary school, because he used to teach there as well. And you find in this East District, you find a bunch of young men in particular that the young people look up to for leadership. Miss Bourne had all those young people in her corner. Those who were not in her corner said nothing. She was able to succeed with that. Another young man came on later on by the name of the cost, Edwards. I think he won the seat after her. And he was another young man. I taught him at secondary school. He was one of my pupils. He used to always like to tell the girls that that's my, head, that's my teacher. Try to portray like me as an old man, but he was well known in St. Andrew as well. Because he started a choir, a glee club, and used to have these people going all about the place doing singing with him. And then he opened the federal school, having taught at the modern for a little while. He opened the federal school just where the purity bakeries are now, you know. Many stories have been told of the choirs and musical groups that performed throughout the parish of St. Andrew. The question is often asked, how did these musical groups start in the parish of St. Andrew? And it is said that the music in St. Andrew started not with Joy Edwards, but with a man named Lynch from Bell Plain, Delbert Lynch. A man with one foot got it hurt that some factory used to work. He had a crutch walking with. He had a guitar. I believe that is sweetest guitar. The only one I heard sweeter than that was one a fella brought here from St. Lucia and used to play around here. Uh, his, his, his name, I can't remember now, but if I put some thought into it, it would come back. But um, Deborah Lynch formed this choir. He had about, I think, six, seven daughters. They were the main of the choir. And the other girls from the district who sat in St. Andrew's Square with the Vaughan boys, Le uh, uh, Lester, who had gone, and then Albert took over the music, Vaughan. And they had this nice church choir. These girls sang it too. So every Friday night, after practice at the church, they would come by Mr. Lynch's shop. He had opened a shop by that time. And at that place, people used to come from near and from far to listen to that choir with a man with a guitar playing music. I know his daughter, Kath, who was a nurse. If she hears this, she's going to laugh all over the place. But Lynch led a choir of young people to Kensington Oval at a New Year's Day celebration when the choirs from all over Barbados that had choirs were turned up at Kensington Oval to sing one song. And you were judged from how you put over that song. And everybody's had a version on the way they did it. Had two or three choirs, choirs from St. Michael at Eagle Hall Choir, you had one by the method, by the, the church name, and then um, I think it was Church of God in Chapman Street Choir, that was the name of it. You had one from St. Matthias, you had one from this place, but the most of them came. Well, we decided we come in the town and challenge them. And that day, Mr. Lynch, somebody put a microphone next to his guitar so you could hear it. I think he had to raise and arrange for that. And when it was all over, sang and done, the St. Andrew Choir won the championship. Then it was invited back up to perform the song again, but he did not do that. My memory tells me that he played the Hallelujah Chorus. And when he started with his guitar, and the guys came in, Hallelujah, hallelujah. You know, the kids that don't stood up to this man because a lot of them see him as a man that normally would not have been in the, involved in this, but he had on his foot, the artificial one, 
and he was there. But the th what was Mr. Lynch thing that he, they told me that as a young man, he was brilliant at school. And he took music as his stepping stone to greatness. And that day, Miss Rock had given us a bus, I think, to go to Kensington. She turned up. And we were medicine now just singing and feeling happy. Those who came in car at the 36, I was there with a man named Manson Hudson driving Miss Rock's car and a few of the boys. We went back to St. Andrew. And that thing echoed all over Barbados since somebody asked if any good thing can come out of St. Andrew. They said, listen, and you were here. But we did a good job, and that was Mr. Lynch. And he's singing in St. Andrew. In an episode of My Community, St. Andrew 2021, land slippage and immigration were cited as the push factors that took people away from the parish during the mid 20th century. Mr. Springer experienced land slippage. You could go to sleep tonight and have a banana tree at the side of your house. In those days, people never set up houses like no. They go in the woods, turn a salt wood on anywhere, and cut about 10 large, bigger than that stand there or that one, and put them in the ground, hammer them in with rocks, and set up a house on that. Cut a water pass under the house and go to this business. If you had dirt and the dirt stuff where the house would go as well. So to put these things deep into the ground for three feet or so, and you set up your house on that. Your main boards go on that, and from that you build up your house. So in St. Andrew, you're in a house like that, the house's gonna stay because you're going right down when you made a nice possible setting for the house. But you've got a banana tree below your house, you left it last night. The dirt by that banana tree will leave and go down the hill or down the corner to somebody else's house. And next morning, we you've had a banana tree, you might find the, the beginning of a breadfruit tree or some other kind of tree, you know, plantain or cashew or something. So it's out of Belvain. Because cashew is a fat pork that people buy downtown. We're very plentiful in St. Andrew and grapes, sea grapes. So these things you would see at your house next morning. And they tell you that. Yes, morning, fellas, you got my banana tree. Or fellas, you got my, my grape tree. So when you read grapes, you get that fella some, and he gives you some your bananas. There was never war over those things because you expect that. You don't get a lot of slippage now. The only place you get slippage is up there in Turner Soil because a lot of people go and not know what is going on and dig up and put blocks and salt stone this. That is not going to stay. It's going to get too heavy for the soil when the water comes. And the whole thing, the hopes and everything is going to slide and go down. It might not turn over and go down the gully like some, but when the rain stops, that will stop there. So you start here tonight, tomorrow morning you're there, and the next few weeks you're going to lower down the hill, and then you give up the house because it is overlooking a cliff looking chalky mountain. Yeah. On his 100th birthday, April 28th, 1998, he was made a national hero of Barbados. A young Carl Springer had the very good fortune of being present at one of his political meetings in St. Andrew. In fact, as a little boy, he performed a very important role. There was a political meeting, I call it a political meeting, but it was after, around the time, 1937, or just after. But I was a little fella. And my mother gave me a glass cup with ice because a man came through St. Andrew selling ice early in the morning, wrapped up in a crocus bag. You will get your block and you put it in a crocus bag. Because if you chip it up too early, it will melt. 
So you put it in this country and then cover it with crocus bag like that man did. And you chip off what you want. So my mother chip off. Having heard the man at the factories said that this general is coming down to address the workers from Baden, from Greenland, from Walkers, from Haggis, Bruceville, just every part that working at Bruceville and St. Andrew and, and, and Haggis. Two factories in St. Andrew. There's another one in Swans, down to Bottoms. But I don't think he, I think somebody would have come to, I had to walk there to get there at that time. But that Sunday afternoon, she gave me this thing to go up the road and told me, do not put water with it until the meeting has started, which I did. And I went by the truck and I put these two containers, one with water, one without. And this man turned up. He looked down. He looked at me. I said, well, that's good enough. I watch him. This time I'm still at primary school, but we are hearing a lot about Grant Lee Adams. And therefore, I go up there now. I stand up. Tired, but I can't move. Want to move, but I can't. And then he looked, and somebody said, you want some water to drink. I thought of Clifton Nevlet. He ran for politics in Andrew. I can't remember if he got in the House Assembly. <clears throat> but I think he died recently. <clears throat> His father was there. He said, Andrew, people. So I threw some water in this glass. The gentleman came and took me and said, thank you, Sonny. And look at me. So i doing something that all the other boys in St. Andrew can't do, see the great man. And I look at him. Then after some time, he came back. He drank all that and put the glass and he came back for some more and I gave it to him. The pipe was just there. So a fella came and took the glass from me and kept the pipe and bring out more water. I was hoping that the thing would finish, give me a chance to clear out. But the guy put it back there and I can't tell my mother no. Millie's son, everybody called me that, Millie boy, Millie's son. And I listened to him. Because I know the next day, either Joseph Livingston Black or Lester Vaughan is going to ask me or anybody else who went there to write on a piece of paper my impression, I got the big word I use in, what I thought about what was said. So I listened very carefully. But he didn't ask that. My uncle already asked me during the night, came by the house, she said, wait, you listen to me, Grant. The Adam said, I said, what did you say? I said, I can't remember. No, he said, no, you've got to remember something. It would take me very long to remember all this man said. But he talked about the right to this and the right to that and the, the kind of pay people should get and all kind of representation was the sort of thing. So I decided that if I asked me, someone decided he's going to ask me, so I started sitting down and write things on a piece of paper. Being a spring, I had to act like one. Because in those days, I had springs living in St. Simons. And their father was Charles Wilkinson's springer. And one was Sir Hugh Springer after. One was CRC Springer, Christopher Springer. He was a mathematical genius at the Corish Ferry. So he was a lawyer and, you know, belonged to the union. And the other fellow, Chad Springer, was a civil servant. Their father was at St. Simon. They did boys come down by the plane now and then. So if you're a Springer, you're going to act like a Springer. So I sat down and I put some things together and I wrote them down. Only to find nobody asked me any question. But I put it there for history. You know, that, that kind of thing dwelt with me. A fine example of how knowledge from one individual is passed on to others and becomes part of the shared knowledge of our communities. 
memory creates the basis for linking new knowledge by association and it shapes our personal and shared identity. Thank you very much, Mr. Springer. The story continues next week at the same time. I'm sure with McCaskey, every blessing. Be real, be want to know.